Hello, everyone. Thank you for tuning in to the Straight Talk Vermont show. My name is Bruce Wilson. I'm the Executive Director of Service Rendered Incorporated, and Straight Talk Vermont is one of our programs. And I'm very fortunate to have as a guest today is Dr. Jane Morgan, cardiologist at Piedmont Healthcare. And um, wow, she's, you know, she does a whole lot. So, um, well, first of all, uh, Dr. Morgan, could you tell us about um, Piedmont Healthcare? What what it, what, it, what is it? What is it? What do you do? Sure. There? Oh, what, mm -hmm. sure. So Piedmont Healthcare is the largest health system in the state of Georgia. So we are uh, a series of hospitals. We have 18 medical campuses across the state of Georgia. Um, and we give uh, care really to everybody across the state. We are the single largest healthcare system. Yeah, I know you guys are gigantic. And so um, let's just jump right into it because, uh, so so what, what, well, what was your interest in being in like a cardiologist? How did, how, well, how'd that come to be? Yeah, you know, um, I think growing up in my neighborhood, we had um, quite a few physicians in the neighborhood. And even though, and I, you know, and I'm friends with their children, even though my parents weren't physicians, my mother was a, uh, an academic, actually, uh, chairman of education at Spelman. Um, I, um, I imagine that I had early exposure to really to black doctors, which I didn't realize at the time was an unusual experience that many people grew up really and never met a black doctor. Um, and I knew several right in my neighborhood. And so I think, you know, that goes a long way when we talk about, you know, uh, environment and what, what type of environment you're living in and what neighborhood you live in. So without anybody ever talking about physician, just I had this broader perspective um, of what, you know, may or may not be possible, what I may or may not be interested in. I remember sitting at one of my friend's homes and I used to thumb through her father's uh, medical books, not to read them, but just to look at all the quote unquote scary pictures <laughs> of all of these people with diseases. And I would just be so fascinated to say, oh, what's that? Oh, what's that? So it was almost sort of like a little game, but really I was becoming interested in medicine without realizing it. Nobody's really talking to me about it. Mm. Wow, that, I, oh, thank you. I'm so glad that you um, decided to be a doctor and thank you so <laughs> much. You know, I really appreciate you. You know, um, I guess I first um, came, um, we kind of, um, I don't know what you call LinkedIn partners or LinkedIn friends. I don't know what it is, but mm -hmm. you have um, you have the uh, stairwell chronicles there on, yeah. and that's so awesome. Yeah. I love seeing you on, on LinkedIn. You know, talking <laughs> about um, issues and concerns about, um, particularly around the COVID. You know, mm -hmm. um, and so um, so I think you're the executive director for uh, Piedmont on the COVID. That's on right COVID. on the COVID task force mm -hmm, mm -hmm. at Piedmont. Awesome, awesome. And so let's just talk about a um, few things. Um, so you had, you know, here, here I'm, weird. I'm in Vermont, the um, Burlington, Vermont, where I live. Yeah. And, um, and I just want to, you know, give you one. I came here from Chicago when I, I went to, I graduated from Northwestern University. Mm -hmm. um, I came in 89, it's the widest state in America, and it still is, you know what I mean? So it's not so. It's not a lot of people who looks like me who lives here, you know. And so I, you know, I sit on a lot of different other boards and anti-racism and things like that to try to help educate individuals who don't look like me how right. to um, work, how come we can work together and look mm -hmm. at um, people who look like me um, using real facts, not stereotypical um, th means. Right. So you had a you had a vaccine message to Black Americans because I know some of the people, Black people I know, and I still know one person who haven't had the vaccines, you know? Right. Yeah. And so what was your message to black American? What was, what did you say to us? Yeah, so one of the things in my stairwell chronicles that I addressed to, you know, specifically to black Americans was that we should be confident in this vaccine, confident in the data that was submitted to the FDA that provided this emergency use authorization via which these vaccines are available because we were enrolled in that trial, in the Moderna trial at 10.3%. And in the Pfizer trial, Blacks were enrolled at 9.8%. The Johnson & Johnson trial actually enrolled 13.1% African-Americans. And if you include Africans, the total was 19%. Mm -hmm. By and large, 
Black Americans do not participate in clinical trials and research because of all of the historical atrocities that have been committed against us in the name of the advancement of medicine and science, where we uh, were sacrificed involuntarily for the advancement of medicine and science that we all enjoy today. So by and large, because of that, we don't really participate because we don't trust it. And so we should actually understand that these vaccine companies were intentional and purposeful in actually seeking out people who are black and brown to enroll in these trials because they understood that these were going to be global medicines. They were not only going to be for white Americans or white male Amer Americans, but when their vaccine was developed, it had the potential to go across the entire world. And the entire world is made up of all kinds of people. When we also look at that data that was submitted to the FDA and look only at the black American population, what we see is Two weeks following the second dose of the vaccine, there were no incidences of symptomatic COVID-19. What that means is even though you hear about these efficacy rates of 94, 95, 72, all of these efficacy rates, meaning how well the vaccines work, in Black Americans who had zero incidences of symptomatic COVID-19 following the second dose, our individual, our collective, shall I say, efficacy rate was 100%. Imagine that. Wow. And so we should feel confident in this data because we have this data. And while it falls somewhat short of being truly representative of where we are in the population in the mosaic of America at 13.4%, they came pretty close at 10.4%. Uh, 3%, 9.8%, 13.1%. And don't forget, these are large trials. 30,000 people in the Moderna right. trial, 40,000 in the Pfizer, 42,000. So when we talk about that collectively, that's a huge number of people. Mm -hmm. And we should feel confident, therefore, that the data that went to the FDA is representative of us. That safety data is representative of all of us. Yeah. Well, you know, a lot of black folks, you know, have all this um, uh, um, idea. Well, not well. I guess it is a lot. Speaking if I'm, if we're looking at it as um, across the country, mm -hmm. uh, I know some of the people I know are thinking about it was some type of um, ex experiment, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. on black people, <laughs> you know, ah. you know, and that they're just going to use um, um, use us for something, whatever. Um, and then at the beginning, I remember at the beginning of. COVID-19 back in March or around that time, it was a lot of articles, you know, and, you know, confusing articles saying that black people won't get the virus because our skin melanin and all this stuff, you know. And mm -hmm. so a lot of people, black people that I, that I you know, could I work with a wide range of individuals in this, in this state, uh, were saying that, um, well, we don't, we don't have nothing to worry about. We won't, we won't get the um, virus, you know, we won't um, acquire the, the virus and, you know, we don't have to wear masks or we didn't have to, you know, because it's all, it's everywhere, it's everybody's saying that black people just won't get it because it's, it's got, it got to do with our skin, our melanin. Yeah. And so, um, you know, myth, right? But do, um, do, um, in fact, we have anything to do with melanin? In fact, we've been disproportionately impacted. So we should completely understand that that is fallacy. Melanin in the skin does not provide protection from COVID-19. African-Americans have been disproportionately impacted by this COVID-19 pandemic. Mm -hmm. And so absolutely melanin is providing zero, I wanna be clear, <laughs> zero protection, right. zero. Exactly. So that is completely untrue. Yeah, you're right about that. And and um and um and um I heard it too. I read it some places. I saw it, and I was like, man, is somebody just trying to make get? You know how I think I'm. I how we think sometimes, or how I think sometimes is, is are we trying to? If people trying to, um, are we going to you know, trying to get make us acquire the virus? You right. know, more of us, you know, is right. that is that's why they printing that? Is why they doing that? But you know, that's a whole nother topic, you know, whatever. But I you know, and so, um, so Piedmont partnered with Ebenezer Baptist Church and you, 
So yeah. what is that about? You know, I mean, I know I, that's a famous church, Martin Luther King Church in Georgia. Yeah. So yeah. what what did you have? What did the partnership look like? What was that about? Yeah. So the partnership is great. We partnered with, with other churches. Ebenezer happens to be my home church as well. And we are really looking in this role as I'm uh, leading the COVID task force to really get out into the community and begin to understand social determinants of health and how that impacts your longevity, how it impacts your hospitalization, how it impacts the length of stay of your hospitalization, the number of complications that you have, and really to begin to understand that maybe the care of our patients doesn't begin when they reach the emergency room doors. Maybe it begins on the other side of those doors. And we need to get out into the community and see where people are living, how they are living, and begin to build these relationships and trust and make certain that we can provide access, which may mean bringing the access to you and not having you try to figure out transportation to get to a medical system. And once you get there, it's incredibly complicated to navigate. And so this is sort of this reverse paradigm where we are beginning utilizing lessons that we've learned from COVID. There have been some positive lessons learned from this horrible pandemic of how we can do things better. Yeah, awesome. And once again, thank you for partnering with the churches, not only Ebenezer um, Baptist Church, but all the other churches that you partner right. with to try to get the word out. Word so of faith church, be, church um, moves, moves you know, the many churches throughout the yeah. throughout the uh, throughout the city mm -hmm. that we are have been very interested in developing these community partnerships, providing vaccines, and really having long term relationships with these organizations. Did they, did they have vaccines into churches? Did they do that? Did we did. Do Oh, we've done we've done lots of vaccine clinics as well at these churches, and that's our primary purpose for going. But it's but you know after that we are invited back to do another vaccine clinic. Yeah. We're invited back to be on panels or to you know yeah. I I, uh, I was part of the Women's Day uh, program, and so that's part of understanding and being a part of the community, interacting, integrating with the community, bringing Piedmont to the people, as opposed right. to the people having to reach out right. to the hospital system. Right. And thank you uh, once again, I can thank you all through this whole thing, and I probably will, to being like boots on the ground, because that's so important. How can we get the message out there if we just, if we sit like in our office, you know, I, I, I pride myself of being boots on the ground, you know, mm -hmm. and um, actually working with the people in the community who I serve, you know, and right. I'm very proud of that. But okay, let me talk about the, uh, Fascinations for a second. Um, um, so there's a Pfizer, yes. Moderna, Moderna, yes. and uh -huh, then uh, Moderna. Johnson and Johnson. Yes. Now, now, okay. What's the, I know Johnson and Johnson like they had that one. They had the one shot deal, and uh -huh. um, but, they, but it came some something was something different or wrong with it or something. So the Johnson and Johnson vaccine had a pause, a ten day pause because they wanted to look at specifically one of the side effects that's called CVST, cerebral venous sinus thrombosis. And what that is, is a special type of blood clot that can impact your brain. And they wanted to take a look at that and see what was happening. And so they paused the trial such that they could take a closer look to make certain that people were not being harmed. And so you have to remember at that time, there were six cases, almost 7 million doses had been given. So this was an incredibly sensitive process that you pick up six individual cases out of 7 million people. Right. Um, so, that's, so even though people were concerned about the pause in the scientific community, what that tells us is that this is really being safeguarded and this is really being watched. The pause was yeah. an incredible thing for us to see. And we understood that this was being in, you know, very highly regulated and very sensitive. Um, mm -hmm. So that heartened us to see that. And what they discovered was they discovered a total of 15 cases when they actually adjudicated, when it really went through all of them. Um, and they were divided into the cerebral venous sinus thrombosis and some were other types of blood clots that you may got, get in your lung or in your legs. All of them though are treatable 
And that was another reason that they wanted to pause because these specific types of blood clots have the propensity to be treated with standard blood clot medicine when you get to the hospitals. And we wanted to have the opportunity to educate physicians and medical centers that these were special types of blood clot that you cannot give the standard therapy. So we had to have specific testing. It's called heparin induced thrombocytopenia such that these blood clots could be treated appropriately. And so if they're treated appropriately, they are highly treatable. The problem is physicians not recognizing them early. So we wanted to make certain that that was done. Again, incredibly rare, incredibly, incredibly rare, um, these, these side effects. And so the uh, Johnson Johnson vaccine is back on the market. We welcomed it back. It is very effective. Uh, we were happy to have it. Um, and we are happy that it has been uh, part of our workhorse to get us uh, towards herd immunity. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that answer. And I was, you know, <clears throat> for me, you know, I know, has anybody died from the vaccination? I mean, that's really that, that just died from it, not, not from all the, no, no the causes or, you know, other medical means that. Right. And, that and, and so there have been, certainly there have been deaths after the vaccine. Um, a small number of deaths in the hundreds of millions of doses that have been done. The, all those deaths will need to be adjudicated because don't forget people who are very sick or who have other medical conditions also get vaccines. And so the vaccine could have been just a red herring. They were sick already, happened to get a vaccine and, the, and then the death is blamed on the vaccine when the vaccine just was a red herring. It was just something that they happened to do. That being said, I think we should understand that there probably are a small number of deaths that may be specifically related to the vaccine if a person has some type of unusual reaction to it um, or uh, an unusual um, a side effect that is not recognized and treated appropriately. Mm -hmm. So we see these incidences of myocarditis, which is an inflammation mm -hmm. around the heart with our messenger RNA vaccines, Pfizer and Moderna, entirely treatable. We see it in younger people, but you have to be able to recognize it and seek help and, mm -hmm. and, be, uh, and be treated. And, and I think that's another story about access to medical care, yeah. access to information, access to education. Access is not equitable and is not equitable through in this country. And so we see this disparate um, um, outcomes at times in our medical care. And, and I'm so thankful because, um, you know, I take myself as, um, you know, smarter than the average bear or whatever, but um, but to see you on uh, LinkedIn with the your, your show, Stairwell Chronicles, mm -hmm. oh man, I learned so much. And I mean, I was like, wow, thank you for hitting, you know, and you was like precise, you know, it wasn't, you didn't go over a amount of anything. You just, just mm -hmm. hit the points, you know, you just, it was all, you know, as they say, all meat, no fat, you know what I mean? Right. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so I really, pre I learned a lot and, uh, and, uh, and I shared, so the, the, I shared information to people who I know about things that you taught me. So uh, I, I want to thank you for that too. Now, and so for your listeners, Stairwell Chronicles are a series of videos. I have an entire catalog of videos mm -hmm. um, where I answer a single question about the COVID vaccine in 60 seconds or less yeah. in a conversational manner. I'm just sitting on the stairs talking with you like you would talk to your neighbor, talk to your sister. And I give you the information in a very small vignette. I'm not answering 10 questions. I'm only answering right. a single question. So right. you can follow me if you like, look through the catalog, select a question uh, that, that you have and listen to me explain mm -hmm. it in 60 seconds. If you don't like the explanation, you really only wasted a minute, a minute right. of your time, right? You can't be too mad at me. Right. Um, can you, can you uh, let us know what your um, website is? And, um, yeah, it's, it's Dr. Jane Morgan, Dr. Dr. Jane, J-A-Y-N-E, and then Morgan, M-O-R-G-A-N. And I'm on Instagram. You can follow me Instagram, Twitter, uh, YouTube, or LinkedIn. And I have this, you know, entire catalog uh, yeah. of Stairwell Chronicles. Yeah, More will be coming out next week. Um, oh, wow. And see if your question is there. If there's a specific question that you have that I haven't answered, feel free to submit a question. And maybe I'll do a Stairwell Chronicle on it. Yeah, that'd be awesome. So... 
oh man, you you know you you know you hit the home like perfect, you know, on your um your stereo chronicles um, show. But let me ask you a question about what does inequity and obstacle in clinical um, research and trial mean to you? I know you talked about that, mm-hmm. and it's a uh, it. Okay. Do, do you understand? Oh, absolutely. What yeah. Right. What you know, one of the things that I'm really passionate about is we need to be able to begin to increase the recruitment of minorities, black and browns, but but specifically black Americans into clinical trials. We have to understand that our best and our brightest thinking goes into these clinical trials. When we enroll in clinical trials, you have a research coordinator or a nurse with whom you have 24 hour contact. You have a physician or principal investigator that's overseeing you locally. And then there is a regional physician who's overseeing the local physician. And there's a national physician who's overseeing the regional physician, who's overseeing the local physician, who's overseeing the, the research coordinator. I mean, you have a team of people just for you. Imagine that, even I don't get healthcare like that. I don't have 24 hour access to anybody and I work at the hospital. (laughs) So clinical trials, if you are uninsured or underinsured is a way to get access to healthcare. Pharmaceutical and device companies often will pay for your medical care while you're enrolled in these trials because they need the data and they need for you to be able to uh, be compliant with the uh, with with whatever the regimen is, the number of follow up appointments, taking the medications on time, that type of thing, and so it's very important that we participate in clinical trials because if we don't, what happens is what happens now: drugs are developed, and they have no data on anyone other than white people, generally white men, and what that means is. The first time a drug is prescribed to you is in the doctor's office. That's the first time you see it. So then if you have a side effect to this drug, you're out at Disney World, on the soccer field, on a cruise, at a grocery store. You don't have 24-hour access to anybody. You don't have a number in your pocket. You're just on your own. And so when people say, I don't want to be in clinical trials because I'm going to have a side effect, You have to think on which end of this spectrum would you rather have side effects? Would you rather have at the beginning where you're in a controlled environment with FDA oversight? Or would you rather have it on the opposite end after a drug has been approved with no information on you and you're on your own out in the real world the first time that drug is being given? We have to move away from exploitation to representation. And part of the reason we're still stuck on exploitation is the fact of the matter is we haven't been provided any additional information on clinical trials since the Tuskegee experiment. The last we heard of clinical trials was the Tuskegee experiment and we never heard anything else. And the last thing that I will say is when Donald Trump was the president of the United States and he contracted (laughs) COVID-19, he was sitting in the White House, 74 years old, overweight, desaturating, meaning his oxygen levels were dropping. We all in the medical community understood that he was in trouble, regardless of the stonewalling that his physicians at Walter Reed were presenting. What happened? He was airlifted to Walter Reed and immediately given a a drug under emergency use authorization, a monoclonal antibody therapy from Regeneron that was in clinical trials. That investigational drug is credited with interrupting his downward trajectory of health from COVID-19. That drug came from a clinical trial. The only other people in the world who received that drug at that time were in clinical trials. Why would we deny ourselves? Why do we continue to allow medicine to to be practiced this way? That's because we've had no further information since the Tuskegee experiment. And so it is time to really understand 
what clinical trials mean and how important they are to your health, to health access and narrowing the gap in health equity. And the last thing that I will say is when we talk about oncology trials or cancer trial, there are specific cancers that have a higher preponderance in African-Americans, specific types of breast cancers, prostate cancers, colon cancers. Cancer trials have been shown definitively to increase the rate of remission of cancer. That's the trial itself, not even the drug that's approved. And yet we don't even enroll in those trials. And then the data that comes out is data on white men and it's not even a cancer that primarily affects them. Why would we do that? Yeah. And so this is what I tried to do to start to fill in this gap, this 60, 70 year gap since Tuskegee. A lot has happened. And we want to make certain that we begin to look at clinical trials from a different perspective. So, um, wow, I get it. I really get it. You know, I'm, you know, I'm learning a lot. And I keep, continue to keep learning from you. And um, like, um, so another thing too, so you're the executive director of COVID task force right. at Piedmont Healthcare. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so, I mean, and we talked about a lot right now, but what exactly is your role? Yeah, so my role is a lot with community outreach and education. And that's part of what you see in the Stairwell Chronicles, providing education because the encapsulation of my role really is in addressing vaccine hesitancy. And to address vaccine hesitancy and improve the rate of acceptance of vaccine and to help us move towards herd immunity, it really requires information. That's what people need. They need information. Without information, what happens? Our imaginations take over and down this social media rabbit hole we go, right? Where there are tons of other rabbits down there. Everybody's reproducing. Now you're in there with thousands of rabbits in a dark hole. Get out of that hole. Come out into the light and listen to science. And so my role was to provide information, to provide education, to do community outreach, to engender trust in the vaccines and the vaccine uh, process, to develop these partnerships with the healthcare system, and to also analyze the data within our system as well to determine how we uh, might be able to address health outcomes in a better and more proficient way as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the Stairwell Chronicles. I, I know people who are listening or tuning in, they can find all this information about your shows, and they can also find out a lot about the thing, everything, you, you know, well, not everything, because you're doing so much. You're definitely boots on the ground. But they can just tune into Dr. Jane Morgan. That's J-A-Y-N-E mm -hmm. Morgan. And um, they can look up and they'll find a lot about you and your shows. So let's talk about Stereo Chronicles for a minute. Now, is, now, one of your shows, and these are like topics from your shows, and you talked um, about heart disease and you talked about the vaccine. But is there a link between heart disease and COVID vaccine? Uh, so that link is with the messenger RNA vaccines, the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccines, not the Johnson and Johnson. And that in younger populations, like under the age of 40 or 45, we can see this entity called myocarditis. And what that means is you get an inflammation of your heart, your heart becomes inflamed. And generally you will know if you have that, you might have chest pain or shortness of breath or difficulty catching your breath when you're walking, mm -hmm. you just don't feel well. Mm -hmm. And so if you come to the hospital, we can certainly treat that, but this is a rare, again, I want to emphasize rare mm -hmm. side effect mm -hmm. of the messenger RNA vaccines only. So that's Pfizer and Moderna. It is not a side effect of the Johnson and Johnson vaccine. So when I got my first um, vaccination um, here in Vermont, um, like my shoulder started hurting the next day, but mm -hmm. I stayed at my sister's house, I was oh, just chilling. And she said I, that I, and I spent the night, she said I talked all night. 
Oh, really? <laughs> I don't know if they had anything to do, but I don't normally talk, you know, talk like that. She said I was like talking, having a great time. Can you sleep? She's like, Bruce, are you all right? <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I'm all right. let me get back to this conversation. Leave me alone. Yeah, <laughs> you're having a good conversation. A, now, you know, time. don't forget that if you have any side effect that you think is related to this vaccine, you can report it in this app that you download download called V as in Victor, V safe, S-A-F-E, V as in Victor, safe. And then you can put whatever you want in there. So, hey, I had the vaccine and I talked in my sleep all night. Put it in the VSAFE app. We are collecting all of that data. Yeah. And then the second vaccine, um, I think um, uh, they were telling me, make sure you stay hydrated, stay hydrated. Stay, and they didn't tell me on the first one, first time. And then um, my shoulder hurt the next day too, but um, mm -hmm. I felt, I didn't feel, I did I feel, I didn't feel like myself. I don't know. Could it be just my own, my own tiny little brain, but I just didn't um, feel like, um, you know, I'm executive director and I do a lot of things, you know, and I just didn't feel like, um, I just didn't feel like um, in place to do it. You know what I mean? I didn't right. know it had nothing to do with the virus or nothing, but you know, I'm, I'm, I just chilled around the house. I didn't, I didn't go nowhere. I just, you know, mm -hmm. I didn't, I wasn't sure, mm -hmm. but you know, I don't, who knows, you know, <laughs> it's just good for me, you know, and I don't, you know, I don't think there's no, I don't know, it's just me probably, but, um, um, so when people, cause there's still a lot of people out there who haven't um, got all this, um, yeah, it's kind of weird to say got all your shots, you know, right, <laughs> right, you right. know, but it's true. But so how many people are, do you know about, about our number that how many people haven't, haven't got the vaccine yet? Do you know so, how many people still about a third of the population of America still has not received at least one vaccine. Mm -hmm. So we are about two thirds of the way where we want to be. And we never really thought we'd get to 100%. Right. Um, 70% was the goal, but certainly as we push towards herd immunity, because this is so infectious and contagious, we probably should be up closer to 80%. Okay. No. Is there is you know you know like when like when they asked me do what, what show do you want to shot in? is it a better side and this is things all on your on your show people can and look right. on there right look at absolutely your show and, you can look so, up stairwell chronicle the name of this one is is there a better side to get your shot right no and doubt. so the answer is yes we generally would recommend that you receive not just the covid shot any shot that you're getting in your non dominant arm so the non dominant arm is the arm that you don't use as much, the one that you don't use for writing. So if you are right-handed, then you would probably get the shot in your left arm. If you were left-handed, you would get it in your right arm. The reason for that is that the uh, vaccine, any vaccine can cause shoulder and arm stiffness and soreness. And if you uh, receive this vaccine in your, um, non-dominant side, then you're likely to cradle that arm and not move it. And we want you to move it. So we want you to get the vaccine on the side of your body that you use to write. So if you're right-handed, we want you to get the vaccine on your right side. If you're left-handed, we want you to get the vaccine on your left hand, your left side, because you are likely to use that arm a lot, move it around, that continues to circulate the vaccine and decrease the stiffness. So it's, it's exactly counterintuitive to what you would think. You would think, oh, let me get it in the arm that I'm not going to use because I don't want my right arm to be stiff because I need to use it later. No, you want that arm to be stiff because you're going to use it that actually decreases the stiffness. Mm -hmm. And um, I know you talked about um, people like me, um, black people, African-American people, um, and all the stereotypical things that some of us think of, th thought of about the virus, and, and um, um, but um, and then you know one of your shows is um is is the is the COVID vaccine safe for Black people? Mm -hmm. And is it is it is there is there a difference? Is there a different from well, you know, there's a difference between Black and White, but you know what I'm trying to say as far as mm -hmm. um um our bodies and our you know mm -hmm. how we are, how we made up? Is it is it mm -hmm. Is it different? Is it a different? Right. And so when we ask to have representation in trials, we're not saying, oh, because we're different. 
we metabolize things differently or our blood is different. What we're saying is um, we may have different medications on board. We may eat different kinds of food. We may live in different environments. We may be exposed to different types of toxins. We, so all of this comes into play, which is why we need to also be included in these trials because you need people from all perspectives and all walks of life. We don't all live, eat, exercise, work, play okay. the same. So our experiences, our experiences, exposures, the medications that we use that we may um, uh, be taking or medications that we um, are prescribed that we may not be taking um, could all just be different. And we want to make sure that we understand every single person who will receive this vaccine such that we have representation. Okay, cool. And like I said, um, Everyone can look, check out um, Dr. Jane Morgan Stowe, um, Jane Spell, J A Y N E. Just look you. her up, just Google her name. And this is a world of information that's going to come up. All <laughs> our um, steroid chronicle shows will come up. Now, um, you know, I'm going to ask you these few questions. I'm going to give you an opportunity to um, add anything you want. Um, about the young people, you know, like, and when you say young people, what, what's that age group that really are really vibrant and, um, and maybe their immune system are stronger and, and and um, I don't, I can't say that they didn't need the, the vaccination, but you can tell me. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, when we talk about people who are 30 or 35 and less, you know, there's kind of this sense of invincibility. I don't need anything. I'm healthy. Even if I get COVID, I won't be sick. But what you have to remember is that even though you may not be sick when you get COVID, you still have a 30% chance of developing long haul syndrome. And long haul syndrome yeah, long are haul. symptoms that you could develop down the road, long after you've recovered from COVID, mm -hmm. even if you weren't sick, loss of taste or smell, difficulty uh, with your memory. So uh, um, um, uh, including inflammation of your heart and lungs. And so these are all symptoms that if you were previously active, you, you may even have difficulty climbing stairs because you're constantly winded. And so the irony and the tragedy is while you are correct in that you may not be sick if you were to get COVID-19, but it's like putting a gun to your head and putting one bullet in the chamber and spinning that chamber and pulling the trigger. You don't know if you'll be part of the 30% that moves on to these long-term problems. So why would you risk your health and maybe long-term or permanent disability when you are so young, when we have a vaccine that's available to you that not only will prevent COVID, but it prevents long haul syndrome as well. So you must begin to think about that. And I know it's hard when you're young to think about long-term consequences. You're not accustomed to thinking long-term, but if you were to become ill and disabled over a period of time, it is devastating to anyone is especially devastating to people who are very young in the prime of their lives. Yeah, and now people can actually, um, like I said, again, can um, tune into your shows and, and learn about the long haul syndrome, or they can tune in and find out the facts that you give yeah. us. Um, yeah, so I, um, I think that, well, first of all, man, I wish you, I would say, come to Vermont, come to Vermont, you know. <laughs> I know, I know. Well, we, it's, we, we need people like you, you know what I mean, to come to Vermont, you know, people who look like you, you know, mm -hmm. and, and me, you know, we, mm -hmm. we need you here. Um, you know, you tell it pretty straight, you know, you, you know, you just not because this is me looking like me, mm -hmm. but the way how you teach us, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, you're, you're, you're straight up down to earth, you boots on the ground, you tell it like it is, and you get all the meaningful facts in, in, in no time. People watch their shows, it's like two minutes, one minute, you know, and you know, it's not long at all, you know, and right. they like, but you have so much ingredients and facts, facts in there, you know, ep the epidemiology of whatever it is, you know, right. you have it all there. And um, do we need that? Yes. Do people at U University of Vermont and St. Michael College and Champlain College and Castleton College and Norris University, do they need to hear you say these things? Yes. Mm -hmm. And um, and so one day, I, I mean, I'm gonna be talking to you about it because I, I work with my pro, well, I have a program called United College Club and there's all those colleges and, and the students who go to those colleges who work, work with us and we help them with their goals, dreams, aspirations, provide internships, things like that. And so um, 
Man, I learned so Invite much. Invite me myself. up. Invite me up. I'm happy to come and talk to people. Like you said, it's just, it's really boots on the ground. I'm not on yeah. any special organization and any right. special, you know, it's just boots on the ground. Yeah. I'm interested. I'm passionate. This yeah. is important for the preservation of life. Yeah. Um, and I am uh, utilizing my medical background, my research background, you know, all of the time that I've spent in management and leadership in a hospital system, and then just the ability to communicate and yeah. translate science into terms that everyone can understand, this demystification of science. Let's just talk in terms that we sure. all understand. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I'm gonna have to invite you up because um, I, I'm, I still need an epidemiology work group for, for here. And I um, we have education around drugs and I call it tobacco, those type of things. And um, so, you know, it's important. I always include all of that in everything we do. I mean, I pro my program have over 50 awards and, um, and we I always, in, in, Drugs and I call tobacco and health, you know, disparities and health, you know, um, is very important to me, you know, equity and inclusion. Mm -hmm. And um, so I might have to do this, bring you up on our, our team. We have, a, I have an incredible, you know, team here, you know, and uh, right. incredible um, sponsors and my board of directors are very important in this state. And so um, we can talk about it. But um, so do you want to add anything, Dr. Jane Morgan? Uh, to um, what well, we've been talking or anything. I can't yeah. wait to see your next um, Stairwell Chronicle. You know, I, yeah. I look forward, when I get up in the morning, I look forward for your shows. I really do, I do, yes, yes I do. Don't well, great, that. I hope your listeners follow along as well. Um, I, I am uh, pleased to have been invited to come today. Uh, I am happy to answer questions, to talk with people, to come to Vermont. We are truly all in this together. I truly feel this all the way down in my soul. Mm -hmm. um, and I really dedicate everything that I'm doing in my career currently to moving us towards herd immunity. So no doubt about um, it. it's a pleasure. No, I mean, I, it's, it's my pleasure too. And uh, Vermont is a beautiful state. You know, I mean, you, probably, you can look yeah. at it as the green, the green Mountain State. Mm -hmm. And um, it's so much, it's a lot of things to do here. You'll be, you'll like it. You know, our church marketplace and different things we have to offer here. Um, it's the um, Green Mountain State and it's um, the, the foliage and uh, the uh, mountains and the lakes, you know, and this is right. one of our famous things we are. And, um, but, you know, I was born and raised in Chicago. So since I've been here, like since before COVID, every, uh, every other month I'll fly home, <laughs> fly yeah. to Chicago because my family there, you know, my daughter's there and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, plus I got some real estate there. And so, and, and it feels so good, you know, just to fly home, get around skyscrapers, get on North Michigan right. Avenue with all my friends and then fly back. So, whew, I'm glad I left Chicago. Yeah. I'm back in Vermont again. So, so I got the both for both worlds, both worlds, mm -hmm. you know. So uh, once again, Dr. Jane Morgan, thank you for coming on Straight thank Talk. Thank you so much, Bruce. I love right. it. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for introducing me to your show and to no your right listener. No, we'll, it's going to be like a, another part two of this. Perfect. All right. Have a good rest right. of your day. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye, Bye everybody. Thanks for tuning in.